be focusing on the okay, on the um, structural part of the uh, brain uh, of the reliability, which is related to brain development. <coughs> Okay, so in our lab, we're interested in memory development from previous literature. We know that from childhood to adulthood, the ability to encode, um, encode vivid memory increased with age. So to understand these um, behavior increase, we are focused on two main regions, the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. So we know that the advancements in neuroimaging methodologies has, um, has propelled these investigations to broaden our understanding of the neural substrate of memory development. What is important in recent years is uh, to understand the reliability of these measures, especially when we consider fMRI. So um, when we are running an fMRI experiment, the participants lie in the scanner and uh, we measure the changes in the vote signal. And in this case, with this technique, we approximate the neural substrate. Uh, uh, we, we approximate the signal in the, in the brain by measuring the vote changes. So a lot of factors can influence the measurement of the vote signal, including motion, we know, like, and task performance in these um, kind of memory tasks, and also um, signal noise ratio and things like that. So all these can be a problem when it comes to understanding development, because if our assessment is not correct, then we cannot fully understand the development. And because the reliability provides an upper bound for the measurement validity, in order to use FMI to understand the memory development, we want to ensure that the reliability is high. <laughs> So to measure um, the reliability, we fr frequently use what we call the intra-class correlation, ICC. Um, in general, ICC is measuring the ratio of the between subject variance as compared to the total variance. Common criteria, but uh, less than 0.4 is considered poor, 0 0.4 to 0.6 is fair, and 0 0.6 to 0.75 is good, and above that is uh, considered uh, Good or excellent. So in terms of fMRI, um, we also have different methods to measure the uh, ICC. So if you have, say, two group maps, you can use what we call a voxel-wise uh, uh, or ICC to basically measure how similar. It's almost like a correlation, but it's to measure how similar the two maps are. But uh, also for the individual level, you can measure on a whole brain. So all the voxels in the brain and generate a map of to see which region is showing higher or lower reliability. Um, so why do we need to be interested in reliability? Because recently there are a lot of literature, especially for example, Elliot and all, um, 2019, using basically um, publicly available data. And they, they show that across a range of different um, uh, FMI task, including the emotion, motor, and the uh, social and memory here. So across all these tasks, the, the ICC on average is 0.2 to 0.3 level, and none of that is really in the excellent range for FMI. But in comparison for structural measures, you can see the reliability is really high, uh, way above 0.75. Um, so this makes us question that uh, if we are interested in, in reliability, maybe there are different kinds of reliability we should consider. So when we think of conducting fMRI experiments, there are basically two kinds of reliability we can assess. One is say you measure 30 adults and you take 30 other adults, so, so another group of 30 adults, so the 30 and versus 30, you generate two groups now group maps, how similar are they? So this is what we call the group level reliability. So if, you, if this is reliable, then you compare adults and children, then we will get reliable differences. And on the individual level, it's more stringent. So the same participant you assess at multiple time points, in each time point, it has to be reasonably reliable with the other time points. 
So this is what we call the individual level reliability. And so question is, um, if we're interested in the reliability of the um, memory effects, and especially we're interested in the developmental sample, could there be some differences between the group level and individual level effects? So the group map, maybe it's uh, reliable, but individual level, it's less reliable. And uh, it, um, we know, we also know that, sorry about that. We also know that there are different task choices. Um, basically, you can generate different contrasts, the task contrasts, task versus baseline, or more restrictive contrasts, hit versus miss. Um, from previous literature, we know that that could impact on the reliability, so we want to assess that. So thirdly, different regions, cortical and subcortical regions, they could also have differences. By generating a whole brain map, we will be able to see that. So um, basically, we have two samples in this data, the cross-sectional and the reliability sample. The cross-sectional is larger, and the reliability sample is basically two time points assessed one month apart. So we calculate the, the memory performance and we use two contrasts, the tasks versus baseline and the hit versus miss. So, um, so for the reliability, we measure the group level and the individual level reliability. So here I concentrate only on activation. So the paradigm is called the subsequent memory paradigm. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the subsequent memory paradigm. Um, so in briefly, so there are two stages for the, for the paradigm. There's the encoding and there's the retrieval. Um, so during the encoding, the participants see an indoor and door, indoor or outdoor pictures like this, each for three seconds. And after that, you are going to decide uh, old or new for the images we, we provide you. So there are gonna be some images you have seen and some other images you have not. So for example, this image, would you say it's old or new? So yeah, so maybe you, you think you have seen it before, so you say it's old, so it will be, yes, you have seen it, so we say it's a hit, so we label the image during encoding as hit. So that goes on, if you say this is old, so it will be a hit, and we label that image as well. So if this image, you, you're not sure you have seen it, you say maybe it's new, but it's, uh, you have seen it, so it's a miss, so we also label that image. So the subsequent memory paradigm contrasts those hit versus miss during encoding to generate basically a map of the regions that are related to more activation for the hit versus miss, or the other way around. So um, first, let's look at the reliability uh, for the cross-sectional sample. Basically, if I divided the 96 to 48 and 48, um, both of them match for age, sex, and motion. And then um, um, here, I only look at the subsequent memory effects, the hit minus miss. Are they going to be different, or are they not going to be uh, different? So on a group level, we can see this 48 and that 48, they both show very canonical subsequent memory effect. If you know, it's like there's activation in the inferior frontal, uh, occipital, and parahippocampal gyrus, and there's more uh, memory deactivation in the deformal regions. So you can see it's very similar along those, um, those lines between those two folds. And even we look at um, what to identify regions that has age effects. We also show like there are some differences, but in general, the patterns are very similar. You see the, the for example, we usually find the memory-related activation increase with age in the inferior frontal gyrus, and we indeed find in these regions. Um, and also there are uh, memory-related increase in the deactivation in the default. But what is more important is look at the reliability sample. Um, when we assess one month apart, does the same participant would uh, uh, show the same or the different uh, responses. Um, so this is on a group level. So 24 visit one, 24, same 24 people visit two. Um, here we first look at the task performance. So this is a more relaxed, um, uh, basically a relaxed contrast. So, so all, all the tasks, so hit plus miss versus the implicit baseline. So you can see in this contrast, we, we see very um, uh, similar patterns. And uh, if we measure the, quantify the reliability with ICC-V, it's um, 0.91. And if we 
plug the O voxels um, during visit two and against their activation during visit one. So we see that uh, it needs the, the, the dots need the hex the y equals the x line. Whereas when you when we do the more um, canonical like um, quote unquote um, subsequent memory contrast per se, then you see that there's still very similar patterns and, and you do see the increase in acti uh, the, the activation and deactivation related to the subsequent memory, but the um, reliability is slightly lower. So on a group level, we get good to excellent reliability, but for the subsequent memory paradigm, um, more uh, specific contrast will be a little bit less than the more general contrast. What about when we talk about the individual level reliability? So the same person measured twice and uh, just look at individual, not the group. What would we say? What would we see? So you can see if we look at the task performance, so all versus baseline, um, there are some individual differences, but um, um, in general, the patterns are uh, similar in a lot of the cortical regions. But when you look at the subsequent memory paradigm, there can be more variances. And when we quantify the whole brain reliability level using the ICC across the, uh, all the voxels and uh, stress coded at 0.6, we see that um, for the more general contrast, you do see frontal, parietal, and all these cortical regions show high, uh, good reliability. On the other hand, when you look at the subsequent memory contrast, which is a contrast of interest usually, um, the reliability level is uh, uh, very modest and it's only uh, more prominent in the inferior frontal and, uh, and the occipital regions and also parahippocampal gyrus, but not in the hippocampus here. So which is suggesting that depending on the choice of the reliability and first the individual on the individual level, the reliability is a little bit lower and depending on the choice of region, different regions might also have uh, different reliabilities. So the third, I used the uh, fingerprinting approach just to uh, solidify these differences. Um, this fingerprinting approach is basically we use the activation pattern for each participant during visit one to find their maximally similar pattern during visit two to ID the same participant between each uh, between each visit. Of course, you can identify it correctly or you can identify it incorrectly. But what we find is like uh, using the task contrast, we can identify 100% 100, 100 of times the same participant in visit two. So if I look at visit one, I find what is the maximum and similar in all those 24 participants in visit two, I will identify the same participant always in the visit two. Um, but on the other hand, when you use the memory contrast, the, um, the rate dropped to 33%. Although I have to emphasize the, the um, chance rate is only 4% because you have 24 people. So, um, in summary, so this, this part, we look at the FMI reliability. In general, we find excellent group level reliability, but in terms of individual level reliability is only fair to good. And also depending on which region you choose, there are higher reliability in the more cortical regions, but more modest reliability in the subcortical regions, including the hippocampus. And also, um, when you choose a contrast that is more, uh, includes more subtraction and is reducing the reliability a little bit more. So now I'm gonna um, <clears throat> guess um, we're gonna save the questions for the later maybe, or if you have questions you can ask, otherwise I'm gonna give it to Roya to, for the uh, reliability of the structure measures. It's, um, <clears throat> so uh, Roya, can you as uh, Ling Fei mentioned, my uh, research, fo research focus is structural brain development, uh, where uh, we measure volumetric measures of uh, brain um, uh, structures as a as an index of brain uh, structures. Uh, so today, um, I'm going to uh, talk about the reliability of uh, measures, volumetric measures of hippocampal cell fields uh, across development. And I want to take some time uh, to a little bit talk about why. It, uh, 
uh, volumetric measures of a campus is important for us and for our developmental study. So as a developmental lab, we are interested in um, uh, episodic uh, memory development, as Ling Pei mentioned. And um, <clears throat> um, uh, so episodic memory uh, exhibits a considerable um, uh, developmental changes between childhood and young adulthood. And uh, it emerges from a state of uh, dense amnesia uh, for event during infancy, and it uh, sh uh, shows uh, uh, dramatic gains between childhood and adulthood. Uh, however, a controversy arises when we juxtapose developmental pattern of hippocampal total volume and uh, episodic memory development. Um, and um, um, in fact, uh, hippocampus <clears throat> Uh, um, uh, undergoes most robust, uh, the most robust uh, changes at the first two years of the life, um, but it, uh, uh, it shows um, a minimal changes for the rest of the life. So the patterns are not overlapping. Besides, when uh, we are studying uh, episodic memory um, as a, um, um, you know, um, uh, hippocampus, uh, uh, sorry, episodic memory is not a unitary construct and it has different aspects and dimensions. And when we are studying the episodic memory development, we will see that these um, aspects, they show differential uh, uh, development or trajectories. And it seems like looking at total volume of the hippocampus uh, will not answer these questions. So, um, um, but using, um, um, you know, uh, the unique structural problem property of the hippocampus, uh, evidence suggests we, we will answer these questions. So what you see here is the hippocampus um, um, and these uh, uh, subfields, then the gyrus, uh, CA areas, and subiculum. These uh, subfields are uh, cytoarchitectonically and also functionally different regions. And also in here uh, combined is the interhinal cortex volume somehow here, uh, which is not part of um, you know, hippocampal subfields, but is studied along with them uh, because it is considered as a main uh, gateway uh, to input hippocampus. So these subfields um, exhibit differential developmental um, uh, um, diff uh, changes. So this is um, a finding of overlap um, uh, where they uh, we studied uh, age-related differences um, on different hippocampal subfields um, on a lifespan study, um, a lifespan sample. And uh, what you see here, uh, dendrite gyrus, CA3 combined, CA1 and CA2 combined, cervicalum and interhernal cortex, they are all exhibiting differential age-related changes. And um, the most compelling um, part of these findings is that these uh, subfields, they are uh, contributing to uh, development of episodic memory and episodic memory is different aspect. So while it is uh, very um, exciting uh, and very, um, you know, um, interesting hypothesis, however, all these evidence are, with few exceptions, of course, are based on cross-sectional uh, studies. And we all know that to uh, be able to meaningfully uh, interpret any age-related difference or developmental changes, we will need a longitudinal uh, data set. Um, so while a longitudinal study are essential, we all know that uh, the longitudinal study, they will have all um, their own challenges. For example, when we are using MRI method to estimate volumetric measures of hippocampal subfield on a uh, developmental sample, a lot of sources will contribute to error variance, which might end um, uh, to, you know, uh, a wrong conclusion at the end. So the factors like uh, replacing the participant within the scanners into two different time points or the effect of a scan in different days or uh, a, you know, age-related changes uh, within each subject. For example, the different so differential behavior that may, uh, a participant might have within a scanner, they can affect the quality of the images and at the end, uh, the volumetric estimation. And, and when it comes to study hippocampal subfields, it, it's, it's getting even more crucial because the hippocampal subfields are different in their size, uh, volumetric properties, and their uh, morphology. And we don't know how they are interacting with the, uh, the two factors that I mentioned before. And also in our lab, we are using manual demarcation, uh, which I will talk about uh, more in a bit. 
uh, but um, uh, we are using manual demarcation. It is considered as a gold standard when it's compared with automatic um, um, segmentation methods. But however, studies shows that um, tracers might, um, you know, decision criteria might change across time. Uh, and also they might be biased when they are tracing, um, uh, you know, um, depending on the time point that they are, they are tracing. So all these factors um, may contribute to error variance. And uh, when we are calculating the volumetric changes between two time points, uh, we might see some uh, differences between time points, but that uh, variance might be just because of the error in the measurement, not actual developmental changes. So this is, uh, these factors made us to evaluate longitudinal consistency of, of our method uh, in developmental sample. <clears throat> Um, so what we did, uh, we simulated a longitudinal uh, study. Um, um, so we asked 28 participants to uh, um, uh, come to our lab. We collected their high resolution T2 weighted images. And after one month, um, we, which we assume we will not see significant developmental changes during this time. Um, we invited them back. We again collected their two T images. And uh, we uh, assume that any differential changes, I, I mean, um, uh, uh, volumetric changes between two time points uh, can be attributed to measurement error. So this is the um, uh, example of the uh, hippocampal body trace uh, according to our um, uh, uh, highly reliable, reliable protocol that we are using. Uh, so to, because they, you know, uh, distinguishing between the, um, the boundaries between these regions are very hard. Um, they, we combine these uh, regions, CA3, then the gyrus are combined here, CA1 and CA2, uh, subiculum and interhinal cortex. Um, so these uh, regions are traced with highly um, uh, reliable uh, tracers, um, which uh, you see in the radar reliability for those um, 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 radars here. Um, <clears throat> so they have excellent reliability. Uh, and we trace um, hippocampal uh, subfields on the body of the hippocampus that you see here, um, and the range of the slices traced for hippocampal subfields. We, slide, uh, we start tracing um, hippocampal body one slice posterior to ankle apex until to, uh, the last uh, slice that lamina part of gemina here you see um, is visualized. We also trace interhinal cortex for um, six slices, um, five slices anterior to the campal uh, body. Uh, but to minimize the bias um, by tracer, uh, we uh, Im implement a specific longitudinal protocol. Uh, we randomize ID and time points to make the radars uh, blind to the you know, age and the, uh, you know, the time points that they are tracing. And also we ask them to trace two brains collected in two different time points uh, side by side. And um, um, uh, by doing that, we will have um, uh, radars to make a comparable decision for each slices. Um, so we um, calculated intercross correlation coefficient, um, ICC3, which uh, is for um, dependent observation here. And uh, we uh, use um, threshold 0.85 as a, uh, our cutoff to define excellent and uh, very good um, uh, reliability. So in this table, you see the results of our um, um, evaluation uh, for um, across subfields uh, bilaterally. And uh, so you see that the lowest uh, value is uh, 0.89 and highest is 0.99, which is um, very promising and uh, very um, um, yeah, uh, you know, good um, uh, result for us and uh, our uh, method. And these uh, results are also visualized in bar graphs here. Um, so black bar is representing left and uh, open bars, um, are their right hemisphere, and this is the sum of these two hemisphere. And uh, also uh, the error bars that you see here, uh, they are representing uh, 95, co 95 confidence interval and they are overlapping, uh, which means uh, uh, they are not different. And uh, uh, we have comparable uh, ICC uh, three measures across uh, all subfields bilaterally. 
Uh, in addition, we asked um, if our measurement is biased um, depending on the volume or the size of the subfields that we are estimating. And so, but to answer this question, we calculated average of the volume between two visits, uh, visit one and visit two. And we calculated also difference score between two visits. And we uh, calculated again Pearson correlation. Um, we, um, so uh, we didn't get any significant uh, result for this, which is uh, good news uh, because uh, it means uh, we don't have uh, measurement biases um, um, are not related to the Campbell cell fields uh, volume. Uh, but to answer the question, if um, ICC measure is different across age, uh, we divided our sample to younger and older participants. And again, we calculated ICC measure separately for each age group. Uh, this is the value, uh, um, uh, th these are the values uh, for total uh, volume of the epicampus. Of course, we calculated bilaterally, but for and uh, we summarize the finding here. So again, you see that uh, we have uh, all ICC measures about 0.85 and uh, confidence interval here, again, they're overlapping, uh, which means between age groups, we don't see difference uh, on ICC uh, measures. So longitudinal consistency is not significantly different between age groups. In addition to a one month delay, we also calculated ICC measure with two year uh, delay. Uh, so uh, with uh, 27 participants and after two years, again, we asked um, them to participate again, uh, collected their T2 images, calculated ICC measures uh, across the fields uh, using exactly the same procedure that we did for one month delay. So here, the only difference between two sample is the effect of development, um, but other steps are um, identical. And so again, you see that uh, all measures are about uh, 0.85 of our cutoff. Um, and uh, uh, like a previous finding, we see confidence interval, they're overlapping, uh, meaning we don't see uh, difference between uh, hemispheres across subfields. So longitudinal consistency of epicampal subfield uh, volume mm, measures over two years also is high, uh, but at the end, um, we uh, wanted to evaluate the census sensitivity of our method in capturing individual differences. So to answer this question, um, we compared the variance uh, within um, um, uh, uh, both samples and with one month delay and two year delay. And our the hypothesis was uh, because uh, we will see developmental changes in two year delay, then individual differences should be larger in two year delay. And we wanted to see if our method is sensitive enough to capture these individual differences. So again, average volume uh, between uh, two visits um, um, against difference between uh, two visits um, are plotted in box plots here. And you see that the uh, variance um, um, here, if you compare, for example, interhinal cortex uh, in, in two samples, we will see that um, larger variance um, is observed here. Um, but we also calculated, um, 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 we bootstrapped the variance uh, for each subfield um, uh, in two samples and compared this, um, uh, their uh, confidence interval. And these are uh, summarized here. And as you can see, uh, variance here for uh, one month delay is uh, smaller than the variance observed um, for two year delay. And the interesting um, uh, finding for us here was then the gyrus, in fact, um, their confidence interval between two sample didn't overlap, which means they are, they are not comparable and they are different. And this is exciting for us because then the gyrus CA3 region um, and regions are uh, the, the, the two subfields that they have um, um, more protracted development uh, compared with the other regions. So um, we concluded that the procedure is sensitive in detecting individual differences in uh, longitud longitudinal changes. So in um, the summary, my uh, presentation, um, uh, we found that we have high test retest consistency for one month and two year delay 
And uh, also we found that using MRI to estimate um, um, uh, volumetric measure to, uh, measures of the hippocampus is also sensitive uh, to uh, detect individual differences. And uh, it will provide um, not only for MRI, but also the manual um, the, the protocol that we are using, which is harmonized subfield segmentation protocol, and also uh, to the um, uh, automatic or semi-automatic methods that are using or based on this manual demarcation methods. All right, so um, in summary, uh, we presented two kinds of uh, data from two modality, the functional and the MRI, and look at the reliability for both. Um, in terms of functional, you know that um, we we find we found that uh, there are higher group level reliability than the individual level, and also when we choose a more general contrast, we would have a, obtained a higher reliability than a more specific contrast. Cortical regions have higher contrast than the subcortical regions. For the structure MRI, the um, the reliability the reliability in general is much higher and it's um, uh, higher consistency was found in both one month and two years apart. But uh, the high level reliability also doesn't take away our ability to identify meaningful longitudinal changes. So with that, um, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask us. I cannot hear. <laughs> Okay, right. oh, yeah, now I can hear, yeah. So I have a question for Lindsay. So uh, when you compare reliability for more general contrast versus more specific contrast, um, I, I was wondering, is it possible that the power is playing a role? Because you use the heat minus mist for the uh, specific contrast, and you include everything, both heat and and miss for the more general contrast. So it seems that the, the power is different for these two cases. So, so is it possible that the general contrast has more power and therefore more reliability than the that, That's a very good question. So it could be possible because, um, you know, like if we just take hit or miss um, by themselves, there will only be half of the trials. When we contrast, it will be more um, more of um, like even less. Um, but in general, uh, the, the literature, recent literature has shown that um, it's more of the subtraction that is doing the reduction of the reliability. Basically, if we look at the, um, we think about say faces versus shapes or hit versus miss, whatever. If we just look at the faces of uh, uh, face versus baseline, the uh, amount of variance is due to the shared variance so for example, each the idiosyncrasy of each participant versus their unique variance of the faces and also some, some kind of noise. And uh, similarly for, for shapes. But um, when, when we just use these, there are a lot of variance that, that is there to, to uh, that is different between participants. So that reliability is, because when you think about the ICC is basically calculating um, maximize individual differences. It's as opposed to when we run our tasks, normally we want to actually reduce individual uh, variances. There is such, um, there is this kind of um, conf conflict, basically if you want to kind of increase the uh, specificity of the task, actually we're in some way designing a task to reduce individual reliability, uh, individual um, variability, and in that way, it kind of reduces reliability. So when you do the subtraction, what they've shown in this paper is you're actually subtracting out all these um, um, variances that is uh, different by individual. That's why the subtraction could also lead to um, a reduction in the reliability, which is um, almost unavoidable. But I, yeah, it, it, if in a way, if we to increase the trials, um, we may still uh, 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 like observe a, a slight increase in the reliability. But um, I, I believe the in reduction of reliability is more due to the subtraction itself. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Along the same kind of lines, I'm curious just 
how much ICC is, is generally correlated with other types of nuisance repressors, um, and if there's something that, that we can do about that. Uh, correlate with, uh, with what, sorry? Uh, like nuisance repressors, so like, um, or well, I guess sometimes uh, it depends on what you're defining as your nuisance regressor, but you know, things like motion, heart rate, respiration, um, those kind of differences over time. Yes, um, there are a lot of factors that, uh, factors that uh, influence reliability. So um, <clears throat> and, um, motion has been shown to be a very high influencer for the reliability. And uh, we know also, because uh, we do developmental research, um, which involves a lot of uh, kids and uh, they, some of them do move a lot. So in this case, the data scrubbing is very important. And we, in this sample, we do actually uh, reduce the, um, the um, effect of motion by scrubbing the data. But of course, they will, it might have some re residual effects. Also, there are basically um, practice effects and things like that. And uh, if um, in, if you have the same participant do the same, exactly the same task twice, the second time they might do better, which relates to the performance. So the memory performance, especially for a memory task, is also going to have an impact. So all of this has not been quantified. Um, in previous literature, the, it shows that emotion is the biggest contributor to, to uh, impact on the reliability, but I aim to do like a more detailed analysis on basically what other factors, uh, like quantify the contribution. We know motion contributes a lot and also um, ch the choice of contrasts contribute to the reliability. Um, but to review quantify that will be a very good future direction. Thank you. Thank you. Research and in fact, I think I've been emailing you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Athena Howell. Hi. Um, Hi. All but, right. Yeah. So you, the the data you're showing here is with um, an age group of seven to twenty years old. I'm correct, right? So it's kind uh -huh. of older development-ish. And I'm wondering, um, where you're looking at the reliability in a one-month span, um, we're looking at some data with with younger kids that are younger than seven, um, you know, as young as we can kind of go. And do you think that these same, um, the ICC measures, the reliability measures, how well do you think that it would fare in uh, younger children where development is so much faster in a lot of ways and where the individual differences are, are so, can be so vast? Is, is there a good way to really test reliability there that you know of? Yeah, because, um, um... We know that in, in a way the ICC is basically measure the um, the um, just the uh, ratio of between subject variance. Um, in a way, uh, during development, if we include a sample that um, has a wide range of uh, ages, then that um, difference just by age would also contribute to the between subject variance. So. To, to counter that, we actually try to uh, also do the young and old. We do see like younger children actually have slightly lower reliability, but um, the difference is not sig significant. I mean, just by visualizing. Um, so I would believe it's better to actually choose a sample that is um, more restricted in age range to be able to um, run the ICC analysis. And also on the other hand, uh, we also tried regressing out age, and that is a, also another approach and around the ICC analysis. Both of these ways I, I think can be used to identify the accurate ICC in a developmental sample. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. I have kind of a more general question for someone who, um, you know, is, is coming from a background where I haven't played a lot in the domain of um, looking at these reliability metrics. 
but I am really interested in have collected longitudinal data. So um, what is in your mind, you know, some of the best practices for people who are, you know, interested in making the strongest claims about changes over time? Um, and, you know, what, what would be kind of the gold standard in your opinion to up test to do to make sure that it's not just due to these types of variances um, from session to session? Yeah. Um, that, that's a very good question. I think um, after the publication of um, the uh, Elliott paper, we're all like thinking about what is what it means for the um, research in FMI and especially in longitudinal data. Um, I would think like uh, it's for longitudinal studies, it's always good to have a big sample. Like everyone would, uh, I think, would agree with that. And also uh, in terms of um, if we can actually include a reliability sample embedded within the longitudinal data, maybe we can uh, be able to parcel out the amount of uh, variance that is related to um, just individual variance due to the scan rather than the longitudinal changes. So that could be also the other way to tackle it. And also um, we, would, we would like to probably have both um, cross-sectional data and longitudinal data, I would still not totally discount cross-sectional data. Um, as you can see, like um, a lot of the group level results are having a showing very high reliability. So in terms of say, we're comparing adults and children just by having a group of adults and a group of children. In that way, we can also generate meaning for uh, results, and then we can very further verify that and to corro corroborate that with longitudinal results. I guess just revisiting this graph again, I'm, you know, I'm noticing these big changes too in ICC across different domains of tasks. Um, and yeah, I'm not familiar with this work, but like what, um, what ideas do you have about what is really driving um, these differences um, per domain. Um, you mean the difference between, uh, the ICC difference between tasks? Yeah, so like these, you know, reward tasks seem to have really low ICC, uh, whereas language looks like it's doing pretty good. Right, yeah. Um, so um, I think there are a lot of factors. It relates to task design, how long the uh, the task is the the um, it's a block or, uh, or event related. I mean, a lot of these studies are, are block design. Most of them are, um, and also as yeah. We, so depending on the task design and depending on the performance and also the the task demand, I think all of these are contributing to the difference in the reliability. So so previous literature. They do find difference in the um, in the reliability for tasks, but some tasks found like the lowest is emotion. Some, I mean, here it looks like the reward is is lower, but I think that depends on the specific task design. And generally, longer scans are better. Block design is um, is showing more reliability uh, in, in some cases. Um, and uh, and also the task that is more engaging would uh, also generate more results, uh, better results. So there are a lot of factors. So I would say we should um, try to use. So so there are also like um, another um, uh, line of reasoning which says that the highly validated task they are actually showing lower reliabilities because um, just because these tasks are highly validated, we target those, those tasks to show, um, to basically tell us between like a group that is um, normal or a group that is a little bit of uh, deviated from basically um, the clinical and non-clinical. So in that case, we are trying to reduce the group level differences. So if that kind of task, we just directly translate into FMI, it is likely that it's going to emphasize on differentiating between groups rather than um, 
uh, amplifying the individual level uh, differences. So they, they, they reduce individual differences rather than uh, increase the individual differences. So this is inherently in the design of the task. So um, some, of, some suggest that we should try to design tasks that, that aim to promote individual differences rather than, than to reduce it. So I think the specific nature of the task, the length of the task, and the, and the kind of uh, the, the design actually matters. It, it is definitely, uh, we could choose, we intentionally choose tasks that have a higher reliability among the available choices. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, join me um, in thanking Lang Fei and Roya. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you, Alison and Paul for organizing this um, great symposium. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. All right, we'll see you sometime. <laughs>